This is the old photograph that I think those of us who uh, studied um, uh, Islamic architecture in the old days, that's how we grew up looking at it, and certainly has nothing to do with anything real. The key thing is here that each of these is a construction. Even what I'm showing you is a construction, but at least I'm making my constructions very, very clear, saying, look, here's this, here's this, here's the problem. So the first was my supposition, as was Robert's. This is really important because uh, in these frontispieces, uh, you have um, lights that are hung in the arcades. That's the only reason why I added them there. There is nothing to show me in the Mosque of Cordoba that in fact there were such lights there. But we accept that it's a possibility. Okay. So, the first iteration, animated paths through in several directions, longitudinal, lateral, diagonal, up and down, followed by a, fo a fly-through, but problems with lighting details. Also, directions, not quite right. The second, and this one I will not go through at length simply because it's published, and I suggest that if you're interested in, just go to this website. Um, the, but the key issue here is that this was the next iteration where the issue of fixtures, lighting fixtures, came to the fore, saying, this is all very nice. We have the Yemeni manuscript that shows us fixtures of this kind, but is this actually true? Um, how about really now uh, seeing how a floating wick in a lamp truly functions? And it functions because it causes light to emanate from lamps in a particular way, particularly once you fill the lamp half with water and you float the light on in it. It creates caustic cones, that is, and so in this paper, which I developed again with the design, uh, a digital design media group, uh, caustic cones are a novel data-driven method to shape the light uh, emanating from lamps. And so, uh, in the world of virtual archaeology, which, and we have a group that d does just that, we have now recreated a complex downward lighting that lights without resorting to very complex and expensive computational uh, photo mapping. Uh, so we were able, I think, to uh, produce high quality simulations of lamp lighting and allow then us for this in, uh, and so we look at what is, what is the case. So thanks to Jonathan, he already showed this. This is basically how the place actually looks before they turn the lights on. And around this comes another question. We show in classes, we are used to images of the Mosque of Cordoba as fully brightly lit. It was never like that. So now, um, the lapse. So here's our experiment with the caustic cones. Notice that if uh, the lamp is only partly filled with water, uh, or very much filled with water, it doesn't cast a large enough cone of light. You have to fill it exactly at the right level in order to do this. And therefore, um, a lamp of this kind, which um, I took from, um, whose image I took from uh, the publication of the Khalili collection, if we imagine that this is now in the Mosque of Cordoba, was in the Mosque of Cordoba, was filled to its middle with water, with a floating uh, wick, it would have thrown this kind of light. Okay? And then in the middle, uh, is basing ourselves on the fact that most likely, judging by uh, other kinds of complex lighting systems available in the Mediterranean, specifically also the Mosque of Kairouan, we would have had at least a single tray polycandelon, if not a multiple tray polycandelon. From Spain itself uh, and the neighborhood, we have a variety of, uh, of fixtures um, that um, we've not yet um, uh, modeled on this side, including the famous bell, uh, but um, there's a polycandelon, and in, from Volubilis, which is next door, is actually another kind of lamp. So on this basis, we think, here is the second um, 
now with the another iteration with the poly candle and with the lights now casting caustic cones, but for one mistake. I think all of you can see it. The uh, program that gives you this kind of render immediately assumes that you're going to have a reflective floor. That's not the case in, in mosques. So every time you put uh, this kind of uh, supposition through a, the computational rendering, you have to then edit it as well. So this is our next, was our next thing. So in fact, the caustic cones, definitely we looked at fixture possibilities, but uh, the, the, certainly there were better lighting details, but the incorrect rendering of reflection. Right? So now comes the next step. Uh, now, and so this, uh, the B, A and B have been published, C has been submitted for publication, um, so, but I, since it's, um, you're, you're, you don't have access to it, I'll talk about it a little bit, and so this part is now with the School of Design, rather than the School of Engineering, it's just a question of who one collaborates with at any one time. And so, we're now looking at more complex visual, rendering more complex visual effects, and using different animation languages, visualizing algorithms. So there are four different kinds, and I will show you what they are. This is called the light cache. This is, happens to be my favorite. Um, this one is the re-ray. Uh, notice that it actually gives you very different uh, borders and frontiers to the actual light cone itself. This is the mental ray. These are all uh, animation languages and names. So excuse me for being too much of a geek, but there you are. Um, but um, essentially, this is what it gives us in terms of information. So we changed the project, the existing project that we had done previously in the following ways. Materials were better altered to reflect real materials by lowering this, what is called the spectacularity. The floor and columns were rendered using a material normally, in the render, normally used in plastics and metals, but of course we altered them to a less reflective uh, and, uh, material and altered the spectacularity, one to resemble the materials of the actual structure, um, as well as the fact that the floor is now completely dampened. We added lights to all appropriate locations so that the ambient light would be, dare I say, more realistic. I don't know whether it's more realistic, but every time you change something, you change something else. The building actually reacts to, and of course it's the virtual building, reacts to any small change that you make. In any case, but in our earlier recreations, we noticed that the number of lights possible in the recreation was actually limited by the computational power that we were using and not by the fact that there were less, fewer or more lights. And so this limitation left many areas unlit or with fewer lamps. So we were able to switch to a completely different rendering base, rendering machine, on the, and so we're able to actually make more of it. So we switched from the mantle ray to the V-ray to better render the times and then uh, develop a global illumination. And finally, uh, therefore, we finally uh, uh, looked for all of this. Now, um, let me just introduce some terms. So global illumination is a general name for a group of algorithms used in three-dimensional computer graphics that are meant to add more realistic lighting uh, to 3D scenes. So um, the refractions, shadows, etc., are taken into consideration. And then uh, there is, of course, a lot more uh, techie talk, and I won't uh, get into it, but the key issue is look at uh, what we're actually, we've actually gone into actual photon mapping. The result um, is that um, I think that our Third render now is actually much more sophisticated. Um, and uh, on the basis of this, we've now moved to uh, the next step, uh, which will be uh, what we be publishing here, which is located the, locating the sun within the 10th century building. So we have done 
a location of the sun for March 21st, June 21st, September 21st, and May 21st, at the time that Al-Hakam came to visit the old mosque. Okay? And then I'll come back to the later one. So here is the March uh, 21st, um, as, it, as he experienced it, coming in from the courtyard. We also moved the old mihrab in. I mean, it's a stand-in, obviously, but that's where it ends. Okay, now just very briefly, uh, this is how, the, how it would appear at the entrance. Notice that the sun is actually at noon, is quite low, right? And therefore it illuminates uh, from, uh, from this side. And as you come in, uh, you experience it uh, more and more differently. Now is the June one. June is dark because the sun is high up. So inside is actually way darker. And this is still noon. So now the question is, do you have light? Why would you need light at noon? Well, this is quite dark. I was actually quite surprised myself. Okay, so now again, June, June, June. Okay, now September. Lighter because of the position of the sun. Notice I did not put in any um, dome over the mihrab because we really don't know whether the mihrab at the time was illuminated in any way. Um, now, um, and so again, now this is September. Notice how the polycondylon actually uh, works in this. Uh, now this is December, which was the biggest surprise to me. So um, what it allows us in, is to actually query the edition. Al-Hakam's edition, uh, we talk about it, we, uh, you know, we love it, uh, say how wonderful it is, but in fact, we also now can say, this is why the three domes had windows, because by the time it was extended that far, all of that area was actually quite dark. It makes sense to light it in a, in a different way. Okay. So noon, interior, polycandela. Finally, exploring something that is not done, and this is that a mosque is used differently at different times of year. So surely, and we know this from a variety of other uh, details, we know it from Wakfias, people give money to light a mosque for 24 hours. Uh, we, people give money to make sure that the mihrab area is lit. We know the, these uh, um, details, if you want, from textual sources, but we've never taken the time to actually put them in. Okay, so what, what does this mean? So here is the same mosque now, lit at Ramadan. At noon, fully lit. So this is all the lights on. Okay. And at midnight. One other thing that we did is that um, we took a median size of the lamp, uh, of the glass lamp. These are not as large as the Mamluk lamps. They're not as small as the one in Volubilis. Uh, it, it's simply a guess. I might as well just tell you. Uh, we, we saw the uh, available to us in the archaeological record are lamps from this size to this size. This is a median size. Okay, so now, so here now is noon, noon, midnight. Okay. And um, the so, by way of wrapping this up, what does this kind of exercise allow us to do? I think it's an important thing to think about because it allows us then to query why and how did Al-Hakam and his builders 
mark the place of the old mihrab. Uh, the why and why did they add the, uh, all of that addition the way they did? And um, I think that we know that there was no new congregational mosque built for Cordoba at any time. It's simply always the lieu de mémoire, the place of memory, the place of memory of the Umayyads, the place of memory of the Umayyads in uh, Damascus, the place of memory of holding the Mosque of Medina. It is the place of memory. But there are hypothetical answers that allow, uh, that this kind of exercise allows uh, for us to entertain at least. One, we have to, in looking at the addition, um, to refer to the experience of the entire building as a repetition of visual effects. Two, the experience of the entire building is repeated uh, through a summary of the haptic synesthetic dynamics of interse uh, intersecting arcades and their striped white stone and red brick surfaces are, dra are dramatically lit and segmentally experienced. And this experience has then been summarized as the polylobe screens that one, mark the location of the old mihrab, and two, make for the new mihrab screen. And I will end with that. Thank you. Thank you, Vernada, for the wonderful presentation uh, that has made us think once again about how what we see and what we imagine has to be questioned constantly. Um, we're, uh, for those of you who have uh, bought, bought tickets for lunch, it will be held at the Palazzo Butera. Just to it was restored by Florentine uh, famous Opificio delle Pietre Dure through a complex program of assemblage involving the use of uh, cyanoacrylate resin. However, although expertly repaired, the fractures have permanently altered the way that the crystal with its relief reflects and refracts the light. The description of the Qadi ibn Zubayr of the palace treasures of the Fatimid Caliph al-Mustansir 1036 to 94 speaks of a multitude of rock crystal vessels in the treasury, many of them of a large size. The treasury was looted and dispersed during social unrest in the 1960s, and Macrisi's account, even if possibly exaggerated, indicates that a large number of rock crystal pieces flooded the market and that they fetched enormous sums of money. Most were various forms of containers, such as ewers and basins, flasks and jars, and in many instances, he remarks upon their huge size or capacity. Unfortunately, his descriptions give no indication of the technique and style of decoration, and therefore are not precise enough to allow identif identification with extant rock crystals. Nevertheless, when he mentions um, two pieces of genuine rock crystal from the treasury, and I quote, supreme in their purity and beautiful in their carvings, a karaf and a ewer, both with the name of Aziz Billah written on their side, one is tempted to think that the ewer could be the one now in the treasury of St. Mark in Venice, which has the inscription to Aziz Billah running around the shoulder. Rock crystal is given magical and healing properties by many classical and medieval authors, but its light properties are remarked upon in all the sources both ancient and medieval, Arabic and European. For example, according to Pliny, first century AD, rock crystal is incomparable for its transparency and hardness. And he also comments on its ability to split light into a spectrum. Among Middle Eastern authorities, the great Iranian polymath Al-Biruni, 973 to 1048, who wrote a work on minerals, Kitab al-Jamahir, Fima Arifat al-Jawahir, tells us that rock crystal is the most precious of stones. 
Its force lies in its clarity and in being like a combination of two of the four elements, air and water. And he notes that when sunlight impinges upon rock crystal, it presents the colors of the rainbow. He speaks of rock crystal being imported for the Isles of Zanj, East Africa, and from Adibajad, the Lakadiv and Maldive Islands in the Indian Ocean, to Basra in Iraq, where it was worked by local craftsmen. According to him, rock crystal from Azerbaijan and Afghanistan is cloudier and less translucent. Nasir Khosrau, the Iranian traveler writing in the mid 11th century, tells us that a work crystal from the Maghreb was being replaced by finer quality, more translucent material from Kulsum on the Red Sea. And he also gives an eyewitness account of beautiful rock crystal objects being worked in relief in the bazaar of Fatimid Cairo. The Algerian Artifashi, who died in 1253, who wrote a famous comprehensive treatise on the use of minerals, Ashar al Fkar fil Jawahir al Ahjar, says that at a 13 days' journey from Kashgar, there are two mountains, the interior of which consists entirely of beautiful rock crystal. It is worked at night, as the reflection of the sun's rays render work by day impossible. We are thus offered information on a wide range of sources of supply in the Islamic period, references to two centers, Basra and Cairo, for the working of rock crystal in the 10th and 11th centuries, and decided opinions about variations in quality, all based on the clarity and translucency of the crystal. Al-Biruni not only states that the best rock crystal is the clearest, most limpid and transparent, but also that it has to be free from cracks. For the ways in which these alter the reflection and refraction of the light, we may take as an example a piece in the Vienna, a fragment of a small cylindrical bottle with an inscription carved in relief around it that says Barak Ali Sahibihi, datable to the first half of the 11th century. And I'd like you to see this very, very tiny crack here. This is one of the pieces that were examined at the Vienna with the photographic techniques of dino light and raking light as part of a new rock crystal project entitled Line and Light that I'm coordinating with various institutions. And thanks are due here to Mariam Rosser Owen, Charlotte Hubbard, and James Stevenson. As can be seen, the crystal is very clear, although when looked at, un at under the microscope, it's possible to discern some small uh, dirt deposits, while where the naked eye can just about see a hairline crack, at raking light magnification, the area appears black. The crack functions as a barrier and the light cannot pass through, creating a dark area. So that's the area you, you saw before um, on the piece uh, without magnification. Carving in relief produces different angles causing complex reflections, refraction, and also fluorescence where the light striking the crystal breaks into rainbow spectrum. These effects contribute to make rock crystal objects vibrant as the light travels in different directions. And elements of the cutting uh, can be seen from photos taken at the magnification of circa 80. You can see part of the inscriptions and the various uh, lines. Um, the best, uh, uh, so yes, and you can also see, yes, the, the horizontal lines that have been carved, and this is a magnification of those. The best pieces, those corresponding to the late 10th to 11th century, have several different types of cut. Perpendicular at 45 degrees, higher relief, lower relief, semispherical dots, and incised vertical and horizontal lines of varying width. In some of the more complex pieces, we also have what Ralph Pinder Wilson called the line and dot motif, here from the Vinay rock crystal ewer in particular this element here, the line and dot motif, which seems to be a signature of the best Fatimid pieces. How 
were rock crystal objects carved? Despite the abundance of Islamic rock crystals, what we know of the history of the technique does not rely on information arising out of production in the Near East. However, we can at least outline the general principles according to German treatises, accounts of traditional German, Indian, and Chinese lapidaries, the accounts of the French jewelers Tavernier and Chardin, who described the gem cutter's craft in Isfahan in the 17th century, iconographic evidence, and recently, through the experience of a stone carver, whom I, I had the fortune to meet, who is particularly interested in rock crystal. The ewer in the Vienna is extraordinarily thin in relation to its size. And considering that there is only one opening, the mouth, which is very small in relation to the size of the belly, a first basic question to ask concerns how a rock crystal ewer was hollowed out. The technique can be reconstructed as follows. The shape of the vessel was first roughly cut with a saw and by chipping with a small hammer, a technique still employed. A hollowed cylindrical tool was then used to make a cylindrical opening in the object. This tool must have been of hard metal, quite possibly as today, of steel, a material used in the Arab Middle East already in the 10th century, and in Iran even earlier, in the 9th, as the Merv excavations have shown. Used in combination with an abrasive, probably of water and sand, it was placed at the top of the vessel and rotated, possibly with a bow drill, in order to start penetrating into the rock crystal. Once the tool had made its way sufficiently into the crystal, a sharp top would be enough to snap off the crystal core, which could then be extracted together with the tool. This done, the cavity was extended to the required depth by a drill attached to a bow lathe. In order to widen the cavity, a steel wire or a group of steel wires would curve and with the help of an abrasive again, scratch the inner wall until it had carved out the interior of the vessel as required. A smooth finish could also have been achieved by introducing through the aperture pebbles and an abrasive, such as again sand or diamond dust and water or hematite, a good polisher, and then turning the object so that centrifugal force would press and rotate the abrasive against the inner walls. The above are all very delicate operations requiring great skill and a thorough understanding of the fracture planes of the mineral and are preparatory to the working of the outer surface. To obtain the small details, a bow lathe would be used with a fixed spindle to one end of which was attached either a drill or a small wheel. One hand rotated the spindle by pushing the bow backwards and forwards, while the other hand, or in the case of the ewers, probably more than one hand, grasped the crystal, manipulating it against the drill or disc. There is a depiction of this operation in process on the margin of a page from the album of paintings made for the Mughal Emperor Jahangir in about 1620, where a lapidary is portrayed using the bow drill to cut a ruby. The type of wheel would determine the type of cut, and its angle, the angle of the relief in relation to the body. The same technique had been used in the ancient world for the cutting not only of other hard stones such as agate and sardonyx, but also of glass. It seems likely that glass cutting was inspired by hard stone carving, and the two industries could well have existed side by side. A rock crystal carver has confirmed that the above scenario is totally plausible, as contemporary carvers use a very similar technology, the only difference um, being that it is power driven. From these slides, you can see the different sized cylindrical metal instruments that are used to make the opening in, 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 a, in the stone, which is not rock crystal in this case, but it doesn't matter. So these are the cylindrical different sides of uh, a tool, and he's holding a rather thin one, and you can see it here fixed on the drill to make the first 
penetrating aperture in the stone. And you can also see the tools and wheels of various sizes for carving made of a soft metal like copper and used with an abrasive powder around the outer edge of the wheel. And also instruments with a rounded top to produce the dots. And this is the, um, now, the now power driven drill to which the wheels will be attached. While the cutting, this time of a rock crystal piece, is in progress, cold running water is used not just to flush out the powder produced by the cutting, but also and especially to cool down the wheel as the process of carving generates considerable heat. So you can see he's carving a piece of rock crystal. This is the wheel attached to the, the drill and there is running water here. The complex carving technique maximizes the capturing and reflection of light, making the object appear vibrant and alive. Approaches to surface carving vary, and not only by using different angles of cut. The Kia Ewer, for example, an extraordinary piece that was sold at Christie's in 2008 with a French 19th century gilded and an enameled mount, is very translucent and has been polished to a high degree. Its decoration includes cheetahs with a collar with link chains carved in relief, but whereas on the v Ewer or other objects such as this flask, also in the Kia collection, the birds are carved from an area that is at a higher level than the surrounding background. So you can see here that the area of the bird is higher in relief than the surrounding background, yeah? Um, in the Kia Ewer, it seems that only the outlines of the cheetahs are in relief, with the actual body of the animal at the same level as the undecorated surroundings. So you can see the very high um, relief of the outline and some of the elements of the cheetah, but the area with the, the dots is at the same level as the surrounding background. This approach is similar to that of some glass carved in relief, as shown by the beautiful large clear glass bowl in the treasury of St. Mark, where you can see the contours of the lions in high relief. And again, this lion too has got some dots. Ibn Haytham, in his chapter on rock crystal and glass, keeps stating that it is through a thinly made and transparent body that the light can play. And the best rock crystal vessels are thin indeed. I was able to measure that of the Vinay Ewer, which although not, not consistent throughout, the lower part, for example, is slightly thicker, has a thickness of 1.7 millimeter for the ground body and just over two millimeters for the parts with the relief decoration, more or less. With such a thin ground body, the risk run by the carver doing the dots on the body of the cheetahs in the Kia Ewer would have been extreme. The Al-Aziz and related ewers, which date to the last quarter of the 10th century, represent a pinnacle of artistic achievement. But the challenges faced by the Fatimid carvers were by no means novel. Rokrista had been fashioned into objects of particular rarity since classical times, and in the central lands of the Islamic world, it was carved probably from the very beginning in the 7th century up to the 11th and the outstanding skills of the Fatim craftsmen must have been gained through long experience in a highly developed tradition. For both stone carvings, such as agates, and glass cutting, we know of long-standing production in Iran, Egypt, Syria, and other regions, although we unfortunately know little about its evolution and its economic and social structure during the Fatimid period remains obscure. However, we do have some information from Al-Biruni, who tells us that in Basra, the rough crystal was first seen by an assessor, Al-Muqaddir. 
someone who judges the shape, who decides what to make out of the big and small pieces, and writes this on each of them. Then the pieces are taken to the craftsman who carves them. And the biggest fee goes to the assessor, according to the difference between concept and execution, an interesting approach. From Nasiri Khosrow's remarks on the carving and sale of rock crystal in the Cairo Bazaar, we can at least infer that there were commercial workshops, most probably producing for a variety of customers. And it is reasonable to suppose that their organization and hierarchy were similar to what Alberuni describes. Unfortunately, the high level of craftsmanship exhibited by the Fatimid viewers was not sustained in the Islamic world, even if production does not cease and will be revived later under Mughal patronage in India and in Ottoman Turkey. How were such objects as the viewers understood? As Kapstein states, light may be either physical or spiritual, and therefore is an object both of physics and of religious reflection. Light may literally refer to sensory experience, but at the same time, it offers one of, the, uh, of our most far-reaching metaphors. Knowledge is light, its acquisition enlightenment, end of quote. The association of God, God and light and the notion of divine illumination are ubiquitous so that one of the questions we face in relation to Middle Eastern rock crystals and the Fatimid ones in particular is whether we are dealing with a substance where the always latent potential of its physical properties for metaphorical play was actuated programmatically, so that in its extreme case, its light was held to represent or even embody that emanating from the Caliph himself. The ancient idea of the divine right of kingship, a doctrine of royal and political legitimacy, also very well known to the Byzantines, appears associated with light in the writing of the Fatimid court panegyrist and Ismaili scholar Ibn Hani, who died in 973, who conceives the Fatimid Caliph al Mu'iz as a body of light fed by the radiance of the celestial world and the light he gives forth is on a par with the divine light emanating from God. But to what extent, we may wonder, did concepts that appear in Fatimid propaganda have purchase on general attitudes to material culture? And in particular, could we speculate that rock crystal was widely perceived as a symbolic, symbolically significant substance one embodying the properties of light associated with illumination that the caliph radiated. An analogous perception has been mooted in relation to the Mughal emperors. A concern for adapting religious symbolism, uh, especially elements associated with light and auspicious sight, to an iconography of royalty. References is made in support to the tomb of the saint Muayn al-Din, the dome of which was given a marble facing in 1579, while a Persian inscription on the interior points to white marble being a metaphor for God. And to the historian Abul Fazl, who traces Akbar's lineage from Adam through the prophets to a Mughal princess, Salankua, who is, like the Virgin Mary, miraculously impregnated by a ray of divine light. Her son, Nairun, that is, light produced, becomes the progenitor of the Mughal house, and adopting a long-established painterly convention, the heads of the Mughal emperors are surrounded by a huge halo. However, the surviving documentation relating to the Fatimids fails to suggest parallels to the kinds of inferences detected by Catherine Asher for the Mughals. Efforts to reconstruct a period gaze could call upon theories of the mental processing of sense data as articulated by, say, the Ikhwana Safa or Ibn Sina. But their reflex in Byzantine texts, commenting on images, is not matched in the surviving Arabic textual corpus. And without such a prolongation, they remain of too abstract in nature to yield clues as to the specific cultural meanings that rock crystal may have conveyed. For this, it would be safer to consider the evidence of the inscriptions upon them. 
The Euro in the Louvre has a benedictory inscription of a type found on many objects in different media and is in no way distinctive. That in the Fermo Ewer, which was transformed into a reliquary in the 17th century, has the longest shoulders, Baraka Wasurur Bil Sayyid al Malik al Mansur. And whether we associate it with a specific Mansur, or just read it as blessing and joy to the victorious king, it is simply an expression of good wishes for a ruler. That on the Ewer in the Pitti Palace does no more than dedicate it to the Qaid al Quwad, a title held by the general Abu Abdullah al Hussein on and off between 1000 and 1008. The inscription incised on a crescent shaped piece probably used in imperial ceremonies and transformed into a reliquary much later in Venice, includes the name of Azahir, who reigned 1021-1036. It ends with Atalallah Bakahu, a standard as long live the king. But the beginning, Lillah Din, strikes a more religious note. And this becomes more explicit in the description of the magnificent hewer in the treasure of St. Mark we've just seen which says, Barakah min Allah, lil Imam al-Aziz billah, blessing from God on the Imam al-Aziz billah, the famous Fatimid Caliph al-Aziz, who reigned between 975 and 996. The expression remains, however, general, and there is still no allusion to light, nothing that might remind one of Ibn al-Hani's description of the Fatimid Caliph. Rather, the dramatic depiction of animals on the ewers draw us to the visual world of the princely cycle. A lion might signify that this is a ewer fit for a prince, but the metaphorical understanding of a hunting scene, as in the Vienna ewer, is unlikely to include notions of radiance. But there are also, even if rare, rock crystal lamps in relation to which it is difficult to avoid referring to the surah of light, to the lamp with the light inside and to assuming an inescapable association of such vessels with divine light and for the Fatimids with that embodied by the Caliph. Indeed, following Dawood's translations of this verse, some scholars have rendered Zujaja as crystal. And then by a natural seeming transition, her place rock crystal at the center of the symbology of light to which it gives rise. But zujaj means glass, and while an obvious relationship with rock crystal can be posited, it is surely a question of association rather than identification. At most, one could assume by extension that the symbolic charge of the glass in this verse would encompass also rock crystal. And this equivalence could be supported by the similarity in the way both materials can be treated. For glass can be thinly shaped and carved in relief in ways very similar to rock crystal. This may be seen, for example, in the Buckley Ewer, where um, the shape and decoration in relief is remarkably similar to the Vienna rock crystal Ewer. Such clear glass cut in relief were, was produced at least as early as the 9th century, as Samar Rafines show. The notion of equivalence between the two as symbolically charged substances can also be supported by reference to records of early lamps in rock crystal. One example is the Kuleila, that originally hung in the mihrab of the Great Mosque of Damascus and was taken to Baghdad by the Abbasid Caliph Al-Amin. 809 to 13, the son of Harun al-Rashid, who is described as a lover of rock crystal. Ibn Jubay, 1145 to 1217, describes the Kuleila as a lamp that seems to be of hollow crystal and like a large drinking vessel. It has also been suggested that the splendid Fatimid vessel carved in relief in the Hermitage was originally a lamp. And similarly, the big vase in the treasury of St. Mark, which may be not Fatimid, but earlier. When seen without its mount, one can see that this was more, most probably its original function. 
it would have been attached to the ceiling through wires fixed around the rings of the upper part of the body. Ibn al-Haytham, who actually lived in Fatim Cairo, wrote a Kitab al-Manazir, as we uh, heard, a book of optics, which includes a section on transparent objects, such as those made of rock crystal. And he states, when the first body is very transparent and the second has weak transparencies and a strong color, sight will perceive the second and fail to sense the first because of its excessive transparency. So it is interesting to relate this passage to the lamp in St. Mark's in its European guise with a silver gilt mount and precious stones at the top and bottom added by Venetian goldsmiths in the 13th century. As Ibn al-Haytham pre predicted, the mount is the first thing one perceives rather than the lighter transparent object. But at the same time, the mount has the opposite effect of actually staging the object, and in this way, emphasizing its lightness and transparency, thus emphasizing the effect already attained by the decision, which I think is a stroke of genius, to leave uncarved the middle area between the high relief decoration of the upper and the lower parts. As for its original function, one can only imagine the wonderful effect that the light inside it might have had with a wick suspended on oil in the way that it is refracted through the high relief as well as passing directly through the wall of the lamp. To judge by Macrezi, the Fatimids might have been inordinately fond of rock crystal, but that hardly justifies making an explicit connection between the light properties of rock crystal and the religious sphere, and more particularly endowing it with a specific symbolic meaning, such, as, such that within the context of Ismaili thought, it could be considered a dynastic substance. No attempt was made to impose a state, a state monopoly upon it. It was carved in the Cairo Bazaar, pointed to an industry wider than the court. Many of the surviving pieces are utilitarian, as the Geniza documents testify. Mention is more bottles, flowers, perfume, makeup containers, part of the trousseau of a rich bride. And even a piece such as the lamp has an imposing Arabic inscription in a beautiful Kufic script, Daula wa da'ima wa na'ima kamila wa salama li maulana, that is a formulaic assemblage containing no explicitly religious element. This is not to say that the lamp could not have been read symbolically. The question, rather, is whether the metaphorical connection with light was programmatic or endemic, a particular facet of Ismaili thought involving rock crystal that was widely known and accepted in Fatimid society. It would no doubt be unreasonable to expect a scientific text such as that of Ibn al-Haytham to deal with light symbolism, but the fact remains that the assertions of Ibn Hani, the Fatimid panegyrist mentioned earlier, are surrounded by general silence. And I'm concluding. How then might we tackle the notion of the period gaze? To conclude, let me suggest that one possible approach is to consider the question of function. What were the rock crystal ewers used for? Were they on the caliph's table filled with red wine, or maybe Sicilian tarocco orange juice? <laughs> or might water have been more appropriate? As a clear substance, it would allow full play to the aesthetic qualities of the vessel a property recognized by Ibn Haytham when he says, consider perfectly crafted transparent objects made of glass or crystal, which have been provided with beautiful designs and sculpted figures, and let them be filled with a strong or dark colored beverage. Sight will not be aware of their beautiful features, for being extremely transparent, their designs will not be visible or will not appear as they really are. This passage makes me doubt whether the beautifully carved rock crystal ewers were ever used for a colored beverage like red wine. And we may also recall that water was regarded as one of the two elements of which rock crystal is compounded. 
It would thus have a symbolic association with the material of its container, and as a clear, transparent fluid, it would have helped the sparkling play of light on the crystalline structure and relief decoration to achieve its full aesthetic effect. Thank you. Thank you very much.